All right, guys, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I know that uh, many of you are here uh, because you uh, share some of the same uh, concerns, you have some of the same interests that we do in, in staying updated with the law. Uh, we know that that's a big responsibility. Uh, we appreciate you guys doing that. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to thank you guys on behalf of Liberty Tree. Uh, Gabe Royer is here. Eli Brooklyn could not make it. Uh, but I know that it's very important to those guys that uh, we have an informed community. Uh, we say it in our concealed carry classes every uh, every class that we want to continue uh, to be a resource for you guys uh, after the concealed carry class. So we don't just want to get you a certificate and send you on your way. We want to continue to be a resource. So that's the uh, intention of us gathering here today. I want to thank um, Jasper County Prosecuting Attorney Dean Nicholson. He agreed to help us out today. Uh, he uh, certainly um, is what I would consider an expert in, in a lot of legal matters. So he's a, a great asset to us today and we appreciate you being here. So thank you. Um, we will get started here. Um, towards the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. If you guys do have questions, however, during the event, please feel free to stop us and ask that question at that point. We will be fielding some Facebook questions. We're streaming live on Facebook as well. We will have uh, the video available tomorrow, uh, maybe this evening, if you guys want to review if there's anything that you missed or you want clarification on. And we will continue to answer those questions as we go forward. Uh, one of the main reasons why we're here is that uh, Senate Bill 656 uh, passed the House and then the Senate. Basically, people have referred to that as constitutional carry. It was widely reported that Missouri had adopted constitutional carry, meaning that you would not need a concealed carry permit uh, to conceal carry a firearm. There was some confusion and we fielded uh, hundreds of phone calls and questions in the store as to the status of the law, what it meant, what it changed. Uh, and we felt that we would uh, host an event uh, to clarify some of those questions and to address that. Uh, so that's why we're here today. Uh, we're gonna go over, first of all, uh, the schedule for what has taken place thus far. Uh, we're gonna talk about what specifically has changed in the law. Some of the things that we're going to talk about are not specific to uh, to you here today. We're going to talk about what changed within some of the requirements for the sheriff's offices uh, and their uh, process for the concealed carry permits. I'm going to give you guys that information so that you can know as completely as possible what's changed in the law. Some of it may not be immediately pertinent, but I'm going to let you know anyway. So we'll get started on that. Uh, first of all, the schedule for what what's taken place so far. This bill was initially introduced uh, last December. Uh, since then, it has passed the House vote. It was presented uh, to the Senate and passed there. It was presented to the governor who vetoed uh, the bill. A lot of people assume that uh, maybe the governor uh, vetoed this uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, he actually presented a letter uh, to explain his reasons for uh, vetoing the bill and of primary concern for the governor based upon his letter uh, was the following scenario. Someone under uh, the new bill uh, could apply uh, for the concealed carry permit, could take the, the course, go to the sheriff's office like normal to get his permit, uh, be denied by the sheriff for whatever reason the sheriff determined if it was the danger to the public, something like that, uh, and then leave the sheriff's office and immediately concealed carry anyway. And that was the primarily the governor's concern. Uh, so uh, whether or not you agree with that, uh, there is at least some uh, some some merit to the the reason why it was vetoed uh, on on that side. On the 14th of September, and it, and it may be on or about that date, there will be another vote. In order for the uh, override uh, the veto override vote to take place, uh, meaning. The bill could still go into effect regardless of the governor's veto. They would need a two-thirds majority. In the initial House vote, you can see that it passed uh, 114 uh, to 36. Or I'm sorry, 24 to 8 uh, in the Senate, and then 114 to 36. So initially, in the initial vote, they did have the numbers for a veto majority, meaning they could override the governor's veto. However, it's it's been reported, and of course, you know how reporting goes, but it's been reported there may not be enough support. Uh, on the secondary vote for this to pass during this session. 
So we won't know until on or about September 14th. Um, I don't know if you have any more insight to that process or. Just to say that, uh, the, that the members of the House and the Senate are not bound by their vote that they cast uh, back in April or May. Uh, they can change their mind and, and at the veto session in September, they can vote differently than they voted before. So even though those numbers exist, uh, and that's what the vote was back uh, this, this spring, when it comes back up this fall, each member of the House and each member of the Senate is free to vote whichever way they feel is appropriate, and they're not bound by what they did before. So, and, and there's nothing to do with the governor anymore. He took his action and he vetoed it. So now it is strictly back in the hands of the, of the General Assembly, and it's entirely up to them uh, as to whether the, this bill gets overwritten or not. Thank you. So we'll know on, on or about that date uh, where, where the bill stands. We're going to shift over to kind of some content of the bill. If it were to be uh, overridden and go into place, um, some of the uh, portions of the law would be immediately adopted. Some of the portions would take, fate, uh, uh, take effect on January 1st of next year. Uh, we'll try to clarify which one of those uh, they will be. We're going to let you know all of the, all of the changes that would take place and then uh, whenever you guys hear in the future, and certainly we will try to inform you at that time uh, that it was either uh, the veto sustained or if it was overridden, you'll know what, what actual changes will take place at that time. So we'll get into kind of some content here uh, on, the, on the bill. These are the areas that were affected that are going to change within the revised statutes of Missouri relating to how the sheriff's office conduct business as it pertains to concealed carry our self-defense, and you maybe have heard reference uh, in, the, in the bill that uh, castle doctrine, uh, castle law, uh, stand your ground, you may have heard those references and we'll try to explain where, where those take place. There's not actually a castle law in Missouri or, or per se a stand your ground law, but there is a, a law that in spirit reflects some of those similar laws, so we'll discuss that. Unlawful use of a weapon is, is a statute that we talked about in our concealed carry class and, and what you could do to be in violation of that, uh, that statute. Some of the things have changed in that portion and that's actually where we gain the term constitutional carry. That's the portion of the bill that really reflects those changes. And then lastly, we'll talk about the actual permits because a lot could potentially change under, under the new law. So we'll get right into that. And guys, I really don't, uh, I don't encourage you to read this stuff word for word. Um, Dean and I'll try to break it down a little bit and explain what's changed. Um, I put it up here for your reference and it'll be on the video, but we're going to try to explain it a little more in depth as to what's actually changing. On the, uh, I mentioned that some of the stuff is going to pertain to you immediately, but I just want you to know that it has changed. A portion of the law stated that the money that you pay to the sheriff's office, the $100 fee, that that should be directed where that, where that goes to uh, for a couple of reasons. Some counties had a huge surplus of concealed carry permit applications, and therefore they had a, uh, a large spike in the revenue generated from that. Uh, and they did some clarification on where those funds should go. One of the things that was happening that they wanted to address and change was that a sheriff may be anticipated uh, gaining $1,000 in the budget from concealed carry, and maybe they got two or 3,000. Uh, what some county commissioners were doing were saying, well, you're getting more money in your concealed carry, so we're going to take some money from you, away from you in another area. And they didn't want that to happen because the concealed carry uh, permit, it was probably, uh, the enrollment was going to go down with this law, so they didn't want sheriff's office to be underfunded. That's basically all that changed in that portion. Is there anything else from that portion that you think? No, I, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, the only thing I will add is that if you really do care about what the bill says, you can print out all 49 pages of it, uh, like I did earlier today. Uh, but it's easier to look it up on the internet. You can go to the Missouri uh, Senate webpage because it was a Senate bill and it's easier to find that way. There's something called bill tracking. And if you just type SB, which stands for Senate Bill 656, it'll take you there and you can look at whatever you want on the bill. There are always different versions. What gets introduced is hardly ever what gets passed. Um, 
what you want to look at is the provision of the bill that is truly agreed and finally passed. Although the governor vetoed it, that's the bill that uh, is currently pending and, and what the legislature will give a <coughs> thumbs up or thumbs down to in September. So if you want to look at it and you want to read the bill for yourself, you can do that. The much easier thing to do is there's always a bill summary where somebody has gone through and read the bill and kind of summarized things for you. That's why I recommend you go look, and that gives you a lot of the highlights like Chad has provided for you here this evening. Thank you. We will also, uh, it's, a, it's a good point, we'll, we'll post a link to that, uh, to the Senate page in the, in the Facebook portion of this, of this post so that you guys can have a quick place to reference that. Um, I did a lot of research in online and it is not as simple as, as uh, finding a lot of other things that you search for because there's a lot of content in regards to this Senate bill. So we'll try to post a, a link to that so it'll be easy for you guys to find. Another thing that changed in regards to Sheriff's Office is that they understand that there are some uh, counties in uh, more rural areas of the state and also some counties that don't have the funding of some larger counties and they were still bound by the same reporting requirements as the large counties so a portion of the bill just said hey you sheriff's office will make an exception for you we'll work with you a little bit on the background check process so that it's not such a financial burden so that changed as well which a lot of the a lot of the people uh, that have been through our concealed carry class are from counties affected by that so it's a good thing another thing that really changed uh, where people reference uh, castle doctrine and, and i'll have dean talk more on this uh, this is the portion of it that they're referring to when you hear that. In the law, as it stood before this bill was even introduced, it said that basically as long as you are somewhere that you're allowed to be, uh, your home, someone else's home, a uh, private business, as long as you're allowed to be there, that you are able under the law to defend yourself or another person from uh, death, serious physical injury, or any forcible felony. So. As long as you're in a place that you're allowed to be, you can lawfully defend yourself and others. What the bill did is really clarify that to that if you're in someone else's private property, that it continues that because it, was spe it wasn't specifically stated as that. But I'll let you kind of talk more, more to that. I, I think this is a, a change in the law that, that, that is good, but I, I think that it also is something that as a practical matter uh, will never really reach. And the reason for that is, uh, and I'm thinking of the cases that we've had uh, where an intruder goes into a home and there is a guest in the home. And what this law does is makes it clear that that intruder or that that guest can use deadly force in a situation uh, just as if the, the homeowner could. But I always analyze those situations, and I'm going to pick on this gentleman right here. You're a guest in my home, okay, and you're sleeping in the bedroom and somebody comes in with a firearm and they point it at you and they start demanding things of you. Um, could you in that situation use deadly force to protect yourself? And the answer is absolutely. So in, in almost every, in, in fact, in every situation I can think of in the 24 plus years or almost 24 years I've been at the prosecutor's office, where it comes up that somebody can use deadly force in this situation. It, it, it really the better analysis under the law is, can you use that deadly force to protect yourself? And the answer to that is always, uh, if, if there's a threat of, of death to you, the answer is absolutely. So although this is a change that, that I think is good, uh, from a practical standpoint, not from a, a legal one, from a practical one, I'm not sure we're ever going to get there and have to rely on that law because almost every situation I can think of, you can look at it and you would justify using that deadly force uh, because you're protecting yourself. And, uh, and that to me is when I'm analyzing those situations and they have come up and there have been times we have elected not to charge somebody because they were using that deadly force to protect themselves, even though they're a guest in somebody else's home. Thank you. Uh, again, if you've taken our concealed carry course, then we've already kind of explained that portion of the law to you. Uh, but it's important to know even those small changes uh, and, and stay current with those. The next section, 
And what this really uh, is kind of another area or another topic in the same area. Uh, what this says is that, um, and, and really it's, I guess, the same portion. As long as you are somewhere, um, you're not unlawfully uh, entering, you're not trespassing, that sort of thing, uh, you have the ability to use you know, the appropriate amount of force. Where this really, uh, what was really touted under the, uh, by the sponsor of the bill is that if there's a babysitter at your home and someone broke in, should that babysitter be able to use the same amount of force as you would? And, and as you just explained, there's really no difference there. Um, it's another section, small section that changed that doesn't really necessarily change a whole lot. This is the, the portion that really uh, we gain the comparison to constitutional carry. Although you won't see the words necessarily constitutional carry anywhere in the bill, this is the portion of the bill that, that refers to that and where we draw that, that ability. If you remember the law before, it said that a person commits the offense of unlawful use of a force if they, uh, or I'm sorry, unlawful use of a weapon, if they carry a concealed firearm on their person uh, without, without a permit. That's the portion that's been removed. It just says that if you carry a concealed firearm into a place where you're not allowed to carry a concealed firearm, so really, they didn't just come out and say you can carry without a permit. They just said it's no longer illegal uh, to carry without a permit, except for the places where it was already prohibited. A government building, uh, a school, or a school-sponsored event, or while you're intoxicated. Uh, the, the bill doesn't make an exception for any of those still. But anywhere else, not exclusively listed there, you can carry under the bill a firearm without the requirement of the permit. So that's really where that changed. You have anything to add on that portion? Just a little. Um, this is the, the general law as it exists now. But what I learned in law school is that for every general rule, there are always exceptions. And currently, there are a number of exceptions to, to this uh, particular law. And I believe there may be 12 of them. If you're a, a police officer, certainly we would want our police officers to be allowed to carry a concealed weapon. If you're a retired police officer, I see a retired officer, a guy Blankenship here, and another uh, retired officer, Tom Guernsey here. You can carry concealed. Uh, maybe not such a good idea as they let prosecutors uh, carry concealed without having gone through the requisite training. And there, there are a number of things issue, uh, listed uh, under the statute, uh, including if you've gone through and taken the carry concealed class and get a permit from your sheriff. Um, so you can already carry concealed if you meet one of those exceptions. What the law does is it keeps this language and it doesn't remove it, it keeps it, but it says that you can only, it's only a crime if you do that in certain areas. And most typically those, those areas are government buildings, um, whether it's the, the Capitol building or, or a schoolhouse or, or a courthouse. I think those are some of the ones that are specifically listed. Is that you cannot carry concealed inside of those buildings. Other than that, anywhere you can carry it without the need of getting a uh, carry concealed permit first. You can still get a permit. There's still ways to get it. And I think the main advantage of getting it uh, in those situations is if you go out of state and they have a, they don't have the constitutional carry like this bill would provide, you want to make, make sure that you have your permit because if it's recognized in the other state, and I think maybe 45 or so other states recognize your, your Missouri permit. So I, I still think it's a good idea to get one, especially if you're going to travel out of state. So what the law does is it, it still keeps this provision but adds a, an accept, or, 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 but only at the end of it, which says you, this is only a crime if you carry it within these certain buildings. So that, that's what, what our constitutional carry provision is. And we'll, uh, we'll get into a little bit more, maybe uh, the benefits, uh, expand on the benefits of still getting the permit, whether or not this bill passes. One of the things that um, one of the things that's going to change under the uh, on the next year is that the classifications for certain crimes will change. 
or that's more than I really want to get it to, into in this discussion because it's uh, basically a rewrite of the complete statutes of Missouri as far as what classification certain crimes are. Um, but it's important to know, and I'm going to encourage you guys to look this up on your own time, that uh, some of these, uh, some of the things we talk about in concealed carry course, some of the uh, the penalties for not following completely with the law have changed. Uh, and again, it's more it's more in depth than we really need to get into today. Uh, but it's important to to stay current with that as much as possible. Um, this is another thing that's really huge that I don't think very many people are talking about uh, with this bill. But this is a huge one. Basically, what this says is that currently, if you uh, carry a firearm into a private business which has uh, posted that they don't want firearms, that that's a, a criminal offense of trespassing. We've talked about that in, in our concealed carry course at length. Uh, what the bill says uh, now is that uh, that's no longer a criminal act. Uh, you still are not allowed on the property, uh, but there's a fine incurred from that as opposed to a criminal offense. So that really changed. That's, that's a huge change in the law. Uh, but it's not something that's gotten a lot of attention. As we say in our concealed carry course, we would never encourage anyone to uh, to break the law. Uh, we encourage you to be familiar uh, with all the aspects of the law. But that is a big portion that changed. I don't know if you have anything on that. So, um, but we, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would understand if you carried into some place, posted that sign, and they saw it, they could ask you to leave. And only if you stay is there any kind of penalty. Well, this is this is what the law uh, actually says. Uh, it says word for word. It says that this shall not be currently under the current law. It shall not be the criminal offense of trespassing uh, until you're notified by an employee or representative of the company. But in another portion of the law, it says that as long as they have prominently displayed a sign no smaller than 11 by 14 inches and the letters are no smaller than three inches, that you're considered duly notified, meaning. If you go into a restaurant that has a sign and it meets those requirements, it's the same as an employee telling you verbally you can't have a gun in here. Because they, what the law says is that they've done everything that they are required to do to make sure that you're notified you're not allowed to have a gun on the premises. So if an employee contacts you and they have the sign, it's, it's basically the same thing as far so as that goes. If an employee sees one, is that a criminal offense at that point in time? Currently, and the, and the question, just for the video, uh, if an employee sees you with a firearm, is it a criminal offense? If they have a sign that meets those requirements, um, they're saying that you should be notified. We've done enough to ensure that you should be notified. Then yes, at that time it would be, even before the employee tells you anything, uh, it would be the crime of trespassing. Right generally, uh, generally, most businesses are just looking for the compliance. If they tell you, hey, we don't, we're not comfortable with guns in here, generally they're comfortable with you leaving. That's really what they want in the end. Um, you won't have many businesses saying, we don't want the gun in here, but I need you to stick around until the police get here. They generally don't. Uh, they just want you out of there. So, uh, And you've probably handled some cases like that, so I'll let you give some more Just as a, as a practical matter, I think what you're saying is correct. If the business sees you and they say, would you please leave, and you turn and you leave, the odds of them calling the police and reporting you are pretty small, okay? And if the police aren't called and no report is made, then then nothing, no further action will be taken. It's when you stand and say, no, I think I'm gonna stay here. Well, now the police are called and under the current law, the officer could arrest you for trespass. Okay. We cannot arrest you, it's not a weapons violation under this statute, okay? There's no weapon violation but it is a trespassing under a different criminal provision. What the new law will do is it won't even be a trespass. It is an offense, but it's a fine only offense. I believe the maximum fine is $100, okay? So there is there is still, they could call the police, the police could still arrest you, but it's not a trespass anymore. It's just a fine only offense, and I believe it's $100, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Maybe a small point, but is there actually a provision that says that the sign has to be a particular size? Yes. Can just be one of those four by four no. The, the statute is explicit on how big the sign has to be. Thank you. I would add to your list of places you cannot carry. Mm -hmm. 
I work in a hospital and then that's the hard way. Yes. There's a state law that says you cannot carry in a hospital. So there, there are certainly uh, a lot of places currently prohibited, uh, and, and that's under the same statute that we've been talking about if you want to research that a little further. One of the interesting things that has, the points that have been, uh, been made in regards to this specific portion, and, I, and I'll just give you guys the information and you can really decide how you feel about it, uh, but opponents to this portion of the bill say that this is basically forcing uh, private business owners to allow guns basically is what what their argument is uh, which seems good on the surface um, but the other argument to that is that we're now again telling private businesses what they have to do which is an argument that most people were just mo pretty recently against so um, something to think about on that again i want to get you guys the information so you can form uh, an opinion on that uh, but just something to think about as far as that portion of the law goes. Any other question on this before we move on? All right. This is uh, maybe some of the some of the biggest changes as far as how it will affect you were the bill to be adopted. Currently, uh, the sheriff's office can can charge no more than one hundred dollars. Uh, that's still the case under the new law. However, there will be some different uh, options for you to choose from should you choose to actually go through and get your concealed carry permit. Currently, uh, they added a, an, an exception to that, that uh, the sheriff's office can still only charge up to $100 for a normal permit. If you use a credit card, they can charge you a credit card fee. Not a huge deal, but it changed, so I'll let you guys know about it. Uh, here's where uh, a thing that, that was really important to a lot of sponsors of the bill, and I think it's a pretty neat uh, separation that we have in our law, in the new law if it's adopted. It says that your permit is still good for five years, the normal permit. However, if you're an active duty military member and you're currently deployed or you're recovering from an injury and that lapses, that they'll give you as much time as you need uh, to, to get your permit, which is pretty cool. That's, that's just a pretty cool caveat in the bill. They don't have to do that, uh, certainly, but they added that in. So that's, uh, I don't think that there are a lot of states that, that have that caveat in their law, so I think it's pretty neat. One of the things that's going to change in regards to the actual training portion of the concealed carry class is that a portion of that training can be done online. I've not researched this enough to really give you guys firm numbers, if it's an hour, four hours, eight hours. I haven't really done that research and I don't know if you have any more information in that. I don't know that it's really been uh, discussed in depth enough to actually get a, tra a training regimen designed. But there is a clear portion of the law now that says that a portion of your concealed carry class can be done online. A lot of other states have been doing that for a little while. And should the bill be adopted, uh, that Missouri will be added to that mm -hmm. list of states. Under the current law, again, your permit is good for five years. Now, there's a $50 renewal fee for that. Uh, if the bill is not adopted, that'll stay the same. If the bill is adopted, you'll have some more options. You actually have the option to get a lifetime concealed carry permit under the new bill. It costs $500, and as long as you're a Missouri resident, it never expires. And in fact, if you move out of state and you move back to Missouri, it still uh, will be able to be renewed as long as nothing, as long as you didn't rob a bunch of banks out of state or something that would prohibit you from having the, the permit. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty big feature. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big change. They also, they also have the option for a 10 year and a five year, or I'm sorry, a, a 10 year and a 25 year permit uh, for, for different costs. That's a big change. Uh, what they will do under the, either the lifetime, the five year, or I'm sorry, the lifetime, the 10 year, the 25 year, still every five years, they will run a, a check to make sure you're still able to have your concealed carry permit. There's just no requirement for you to go in and change anything You get a new card that card will be good for the duration of whatever you've paid for. And basically, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I heard that on the lifetime and the 25 and 10 years that the other states will not accept the reciprocity. The, and the question just for the, the video was that if we go to the lifetime or the 10 or 25 year um, permit, will other states honor the reciprocity? It's anticipated that if this bill is adopted, there will be a lot of states that will no longer honor the Missouri permit. 
We don't know exactly what, how many states that will be, but based upon other states who have gone through this process, a lot of states aren't comfortable with, with constitutional carry, meaning no permit is required, and just that there are so many differences now that they're not gonna honor our permit. I would anticipate a, a decent amount of states no longer honoring the Missouri permit should we adopt the bill until we meet whatever requirements those states are looking for. I think that the closer a state is to Missouri, for example, uh, Arkansas or Oklahoma, I think that if, if we had big enough changes that those states no longer honored our permit, that probably in the next few legislative sessions, we would try to tweak it a little bit to get them back on board. Uh, but if it's if it's states that aren't real border states, I don't think that it, there would be such a rush to fix that. I don't, I don't know if you have any insight on that. I don't um, know. As far as reciprocity. Okay. And that is, uh, that's that's the basic changes, guys. And, um, and I'm going to let Dean, maybe if there's anything that, that we didn't cover completely. Uh, but this is the time we're going to field your, your questions, whatever you may have. They don't have to be specific to anything that we talked about here. Uh, we're going to be uh, fielding some Facebook questions as well. Uh, but Dean, do you have anything to talk about before we get into that? I just want to, since you mentioned the uh, online course, currently to get a, a permit, yeah, I think the class has to be at least eight hours long. And there's a certain number of things you have to be proficient at in order to get your permit. What the new law will provide is that if you go online and do at least a one hour training, then you can go to a certified firearms instructor and you have to show the ability to do those eight things required under the statute, but there's no set time length. So instead of requiring an eight hour class and being proficient at those things, and the, the trainer has to certify that, if you go online and take one hour, then there is no minimum or maximum time limit on the, the class that you have to take. You just have to show that you can do all of the things that the law requires you to do. Yes, sir. I heard a month or so ago, and I'll just read it first. Uh, something about a judge that stepped in was going to try to stop them being able to override the ego or something. Well, I, I hear that wrong. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen there, I'm, but I get my guess as to what will happen, and this is just my guess, is in September they'll have the veto session. Then they'll decide are they going to override the veto or not. If it is overridden, I do expect a challenge. Uh, in the court system and the Missouri Supreme Court will ultimately decide whether the bill is constitutional. I, I, I don't have, I can't quote you chapter and verse on that. Nobody's told me that, but just being around for a while, that, that's my best educated guess as to what will happen. It's just like amendment, uh, what, I think it was amendment five that passed a couple of years ago and there was a challenge to it, but it withstood constitutional challenge. The felon in possession, uh, came under uh, attack because of that amendment, um, but the, the Supreme Court upheld that we can still prosecute. If you're a convicted felon, you cannot carry a, a handgun. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay, and some of these, like that, uh, we're allowed to carry in our car. Without a permit right now, yeah. correct. Okay. As long as you are 19 years or older. Okay, if uh, say, like a city like Wood City that doesn't allow us, the, the state law says that you can carry it in your car without a permit. That, that's just a good safety matter, but yes, it is not a, a violation of the law, and the, and the city cannot override the state statute on that. So, yes, sir. Okay, what about if you are in the parking lot of the post office, the hospital? Somewhere at the courthouse, can you leave your weapon in the car? Where do you stand? No, and, and I'll let you really certainly clarify that. Because As, I read in one of the post office, it says the premises may be in the lot. Well, that's, and, and that's a federal building a federal. And, and not a state building. So we, we actually cannot prosecute any crime that happens at a post office found out the hard way when down in Newton County somebody broke into a post office they charged him with burglary in state court and got convicted and it went up on appeal and our court of appeals held we have no jurisdiction 
to prosecute a burglary that happens at a post office because that's federal property and we can't do it. So in your question, I think there's a difference between a post office and then a hospital or a courts building that is a state-owned courts building where, uh, at least my interpretation, if, if somebody came on to the, uh, the, the parking lot, there is no parking lot on the square, but we do have parking lots around the square, um, and they, they had a gun in there, I don't think that's a violation. It's not a violation until you go, and, and there are signs at, at both the courthouse in Carthage and the courts building in Joplin that say no concealed weapons are, are allowed. If, if once you go in the building, that's when the, the, the breach of the law occurs. As long as you're out in the parking lot, I don't think that's an issue. And one, one of the things that uh, that we get more often, the question is this school. A lot of parents drop their kids off. They may have a concealed firearm. Uh, they just want to drop their kid off. They're not getting out of the car. And basically, there, there's some case law with that that says as long as it's not displayed, uh, so that would be not considered a violation. Uh, however, if it, as always, if you can avoid that situation, I think it's it's uh, better to not walk on the gray area. If you can make it as clear as possible that you have no intention to violate, I think that's the safest bet. Okay, follow up on this. I work in the post office. They say that they can search my vehicle at any time, anywhere. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this if before I we get off post office property on the public street. Before before we get too much into the question, I'll just give this caveat that a private employer uh, can can have different requirements of their employees while they're acting in capacity of their job. For example, if a teacher wanted to have uh, a firearm uh, in their vehicle, if the school had a rule against that, and you know if it, if it was off grounds. The school could fire her regardless of the legality of that. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's a difference in the civil aspect of your employment and the criminal law. And I'll let I'll let Dean talk more to the criminal uh, aspect of that. But specifically to your to your issue, we'll talk to you more after one on one if you'd like. Um, and I know we had some other questions. Really quickly, I want to get to a Facebook question because I think it's a, it's a good one. Uh, this comes to us from uh, Clint Whitman. He said that under the new law. Uh, will will Missouri open carry law change at all? And I'll let you I'll let you take this one. Is there is there anything that's going to change in regards to open carry? I don't think so. I think this I think this law only addresses the carry concealed uh, aspect, uh, and, and obviously would open it up quite a bit. But I don't think it changes the open carry. Okay. We had some other questions from the from the crowd. Yes, ma'am. With respect to when the depossession happens and they overturn this. And if it goes to the Missouri Supreme Court, would you pay? Would there be a hold on what 656? So the question was during the uh, if if the if the bill is overridden mm -hmm. and it goes into effect and it's appealed to the Supreme Court, what happens in the limbo time right. while they're deciding that? If the law becomes the law. So if I go and pay my five hundred dollars for my lifeline permit. You, you might lose your $500 if the Supreme Court holds it unconstitutional. Sometimes the court will, will issue an injunction, I, 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 but I can't think of a time that they've done that on something like this. The law becomes the law until it's, it's held unconstitutional, okay? But you have to realize the consequence if it is held unconstitutional, if you acted and paid your $500, you're, you're gonna be out your $500, okay? We had another uh, Facebook question really quickly. Uh, basically, uh, he asked if uh, what, what the reasoning was behind the uh, representatives uh, in the Senate and the House changing their vote. And I know that's probably not a real easy answer, but basically it's just that they uh, either have not agreed with all of the additions made to the bill from its first reading or <laughs> And, and, and sometimes it's like anybody who makes a decision. How many times you've made a decision and then uh, three days later say, well, if, if I would have known, you know, three days ago what I know now, I may have made a different decision. And, and legislators are the same way. Um, there, there's going to be 
uh, from May till September, and maybe they learn things in the interim that they didn't know in May, and and those issues come to light, because those people who are against this are certainly not just sitting still; they're looking for different things, and and the governor pointed out some things in his veto letter that that maybe weren't brought up in in a house debate or a senate debate, uh, or in a committee hearing, and and so those things can happen, and so the. the there are reasons why they, they changed their mind. And, and that's if, if, if they didn't have the opportunity to do that, there wouldn't be a veto session. You would just look at whether the governor vetoed it, then you'd look back at the vote and say it's up or down. And that, that's not our system of government. There's, there's always time to allow folks to gather more information to allow them to make what, what hopefully is the best decision they can make. Do you have any other questions? I'm just curious if he could kind of talk through some of the things you see and come through the court that for us. Sure, sure. Um, let me let me grab this other question and then I'll hand the floor over. I have uh, my son was brought out of the vehicles uh, a few weeks ago. And he was not away at the time it happened. But had he been, yeah, he's been still in carrier time and everything. What would happen if he had shot the person who was throwing the stuff out of there, got out of his shop, or didn't have that? So the, the question is the, the legality and uh, appropriate use of force for someone uh, stealing out of a vehicle, or in Missouri, that's called uh, tampering. Uh, for those of you who have been through the concealed carry course, we address this specifically, but tampering is a crime in which you can use an appropriate uh, amount or a reasonable amount of force to prevent that from occurring. That is not inclusive in deadly force. So a, a offense of tampering, whether first or second degree, states in the law that you can respond with a reasonable amount of force, a reasonable amount of physical force even. However, it does not include deadly force. It does have the caveat that say, says that that event can independently rise to the level of deadly force, but just the fact that someone's stealing out of your vehicle is not uh, justification in Missouri for the use of deadly force. So well, one of the things that we, <laughs> the, the response, the that's, response that's still deadly force, it just didn't result in death. Yeah, the, the response. I'm not meaning to, that's not a smart aleck answer that shooting a gun is deadly force. Whether a death results or not, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the use of the deadly force. Generally, what I tell people in the class is that getting shot in the leg, in my opinion, is a serious physical injury that runs a risk of, of death. And, uh, and I, I volunteer anyone who thinks that getting shot in the leg is not a serious physical injury. We'll try it out up here. We'll see if it changes their mind. So, and uh, in, regards, in regards to your question, I'll let Dean take over on that one uh, to more completely answer that for you. I don't know if I heard your entire question. If, I hate to ask you to repeat it, but I'm going to. I'm just curious what some of the things you've seen coming through that would be lessons for us. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I think the, the thing that you always have to remember is we really frown upon people shooting other people. I mean, just as a society, we really frown upon that. However, uh, what, what I think everybody always understands in, in your situation with your son is, and, and, we, and, and I think uh, this gentleman here said, did you feel that your life was in danger? And, and that's what it almost always comes back to. There are laws on use of deadly force for things other than, than persons, but I cannot think of a situation in the almost 24 years I've been doing this where somebody who, who was justified in using deadly force, it wasn't because their person was in danger. Um, we've had situations, and, and a couple of them, where, where good, honest, law-abiding citizens encountered a situation and uh, held somebody at gunpoint and called the police, and law enforcement showed up. There was one with uh, uh, the sheriff's office, I can remember. We've had them with, the, with different local police departments. Always, 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 always call 911, okay? Um, make sure you're safe. But call 911, have the police come out, and, and that's what those brave men and women are trained to do. 
and and they'll be there and if you, especially if you say there's an intruder or somebody is, is breaking into my car those are the priority calls and that's when they send send folks quickly out to you um, I'll, I'll give you my situation as, and my own personal example um, this was um, almost 20 years ago now but my wife and I had sold the house and in Carthage and we were moving to Carl Junction uh, and that happened literally overnight and we weren't ready to move but we were going to and we didn't have a house and my folks had uh, a house for sale in Java and they had moved to Canada so I called mom and dad and said hey can we come squat at your house for a while and they said sure it was good for them because the house wasn't empty it was good for us because a free place to stay for a couple months uh, and uh, my wife always thought somebody was breaking in and one one morning she woke me up somebody's breaking into the house i stood up and i listened and i could hear the sound of the water from the sprinkler system hitting the side of the house nobody's breaking in we're fine well one night and it was a monday night um, i my wife had gone to bed i stayed up and did what every red-blooded american man should do on monday night in the fall which was watch the end of the monday night football game and so when I went to bed, about an hour later, my wife wakes me up. So somebody's breaking into the house. I'm like, here we go again. So, uh, but I wake up and I could see a light coming down the stairs from the kitchen. I said, have you been upstairs since I've come to bed? She said, no. I said, somebody's breaking into the house. Call 911. Um, and, and I was trying to find a golf club or a bat or something. I didn't have anything. Everything's in storage because we're in between houses. But I, I yelled up the stairs, something polite, like, I know you're here, would you please leave? Because I'm being recorded and it's on Facebook, I won't tell you exactly what I said. <laughs> uh, but this voice comes down the stairs and it says, but it's my house. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> what are you doing? Didn't your mom call you and tell you that I was coming home? I said, no. My dad was in business and, and, and he worked at FAG Bearings and and he had a business uh, meeting, so he thought he would stay in his own house. I mean, imagine that thought instead of a hotel. But, but the reason why I tell you that is um, if, if I was the kind that, that shot first and asked questions later, I would have killed my dad. And, and I, I, I would still be upset by that. My dad's a great man. Um, and I'm fortunate at age 52 to still have my mom and dad. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, if you have teenage kids, I have three teenagers. I know they would never try to sneak in the house because when you were teenagers, you never snuck out and tried to sneak back in. Your teenagers won't either. Um, but, but just be careful. There are situations that do happen where there are legitimate intruders and folks have used uh, force and, and it has been legitimate. Um, but there are also horrible examples out there of, of folks who've been in my situation that like with my dad and did shoot and I, there was one in Cape Girardeau I could, can specifically remember where somebody uh, was awakened in the middle of the night and went down and, and he could hear them outside of his front door and it's three in the morning and so he shoots and he opens the door and there's his best friend dead on his doorstep who's kind of playing a prank on him. Now was it a justified use of force? Yes. But the person had to bury his, his best friend and so although he wasn't charged criminally there, there's a much bigger aspect so just be careful call 911 i can't emphasize that enough with your cell phone these days it's easy to do just hit 911 and and start screaming what's going on and and the cavalry will show up they're good folks that's what they they're trained to do when the tornado happened and so many people are going the other way you see all the law enforcement officers going to where the trouble is that's why i i, I admire their courage and question their sanity um so call them Okay. But um, but there are instances where it has happened and it's been legitimate. But but my advice from my own story is just be careful. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Very long answer to a very short question. Yes. Okay. So fire your weapons off to deadly force. Where do you draw the line? Or uh, what offense does someone have to commit to draw the weapons and uh, point at someone? So the question is what what offense? Uh, meets the justification for deadly force. No, not deadly force, sorry, but actually holding someone there. Okay. And uh, you know you're not going to shoot them. 
they don't know that, but where do you draw a line where, you know, if someone just comes here a lot. And here's what I'll, here's how I'll respond, and it's not going to be a very detailed answer, but it's going to be the right answer. The, the law allows you to do what is reasonable. And I know that that doesn't specifically answer every single scenario, but if you think it, if it's if it's a reasonable time uh, for you to respond a certain way, then then I think that that's uh, generally going to be deemed uh, appropriate in that circumstance. I think that if uh, if the mailman drops a letter in the mailbox and hear, you hear something outside your door, that's probably not the best time to draw your firearm because it's not reasonable. And that's really what it comes down to. There are there are a million scenarios I could give you where it would be appropriate for you to draw your firearm, uh, but that's really all it comes down to. Is this reasonable? With the information that I have, would another reasonable person respond similarly to how I responded? I think that's the best you can hope for. What if I get in charge of them? If someone comes up yeah. on there, I'm going to Yeah, I get to look for Yeah, Pro and, and that might be because just, just them being on your yard is probably not a reasonable use of a show of deadly force, okay? And, and what my guide would be in deciding whether to charge is looking at whether if you did pull the trigger, would that have been a reasonable use of the deadly force, okay? Because there is a law that says you cannot display uh, a weapon like that in an angry or threatening man. That's a class D felony of unlawful use of a weapon. But it's not what I think is reasonable. And it's not what a judge would think is reasonable. It's ultimately what 12 citizens of Jasper County sitting in a jury box would decide is reasonable or not. And sometimes if there's a close, like there, there are plenty of times there are close calls and I'm not sure one way or the other, but I think that it is unreasonable, then we'll take that and we may ask a, a 12 members of Jasper County jury to say, what do you think? And so, so that's the ultimate question, okay? But the statute that, there is a statute, and it's not an assault statute, it's, it's a weapon statute that says you cannot display uh, any weapon readily capable of lethal use in an angry or threatening manner. Okay? Even on your own property? Even on your own property. What if you get yes. threat? You now you're back to, to self-defense. And, and I, I tried to mention that is, then I think it's okay. Because the law also says that that is a crime unless you're acting in lawful self-defense. That counts as your vehicle too. Say you're in your vehicle like a stop sign. I don't care where you are. You got a tire, get in your car, and you know, you're not using some force there. You know, you're in your car, so you got a stop sign on the street. I, I don't think the law really cares where your two feet are on God's green earth. Okay? <laughs> if it's you that you're defending, I don't care if it's your house, my house, anybody's house, anybody's car, the street, any part, it's do you have the ability at that point in time to defend yourself because you think you're, you're in danger of death. And that's what the law says is that as long as you're somewhere you're allowed to be, as long as you're not committing a crime or trespassing, uh, including in your own vehicle at a stop sign. Absolutely. What was the question back here? Captain, I'm prepared with this question. Understanding the self-control aspect of it, detaining someone at gunpoint until 9 or 11 response, well, there are, there are uh, what are called um, emergency response guidelines, something something like that. That dispatch uh, dispatchers are uh, guided to to help you get through any given situation. If you call and say someone's choking, they go to that uh, response and it tells them step by step what to do. If you're in an incident where you have someone at gunpoint, they're going to explain to you what to do, uh, almost step for you know step for step. Of course, that can account for variables like you know something changing in your situation, but that's where that communication, as soon as is is practically possible, getting on the phone with nine one one, because you're going to get that direction. And if and if nothing else, if you if you found later on that maybe it wasn't appropriate, you can at least say that I I had another reasonable person there who directed me in this and and kind of have some some a little bit of backing as far as that goes. The only thing I will add to that is there may be a civil uh, aspect to that that I don't want to ignore. And although that's not something I deal with, they're, they're, I, I always go back to Goma Pyle and citizen's arrest, okay? If, if, if you're holding them at gunpoint, you've essentially arrested them, okay? Now, 
if you're a police officer and you do it and you've made a mistake and you thought you had probable cause, but it turns out you didn't, you're not going to get sued because the law gives you immunity from that. And the law should give officers immunity from that. Um, you don't have the same protection. A private citizen does not have that immunity and you would be subjecting yourself to a civil lawsuit uh, at that point in time. So there may not be a criminal response, but just be aware, I, I, I don't wanna be remiss in just mentioning that that's a possibility. I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen or whatever, but it's just a possibility. So you would recommend at that point, uh, let's say it's, not really self-defense, but well, let's say calling it self-defense. You got something in pain, you call 911. At that point, you want to let that person know you going off and let you guys handle the situation and kind of try to walk away and kind of save myself at that point? I, I don't think you have the duty to walk away. Um, I, I just wanted to make you aware that even though you've acted reasonably under the law and you don't get a, a criminal charge, some somebody out there still may file a civil suit against you. I just want to make you aware of that possibility. Is that even if they're convicted? <laughs> no, if they're convicted, then you had probable cause. In fact, you had proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now you don't have to worry about that. Okay, It's only if you were wrong. What the law says specifically in that statute is that you can lawfully detain someone and prevent them from escaping if it's reasonable to believe that they committed a crime and if they did in fact commit the crime. And I always give the example of if you're at the gas station and you see a person run out of the gas station with a case of beer and they're running as fast as they can and the clerk opens the door and says, hey, stop that person. It's reasonable at that time to believe maybe that person grabbed a case of beer and ran out. So you may detain that person, prevent them from escaping and the clerk comes up and says, Thank you for stopping him. He almost left his change on the counter. Here's your change, right? So we have to be careful that just because a reasonable person would believe, they still have to have, in fact, committed the crime if, if you're going to take that action. And that's why we always advocate. I would much rather have you, uh, you know, alive and well as a good witness for me than someone who was hurt or even killed trying to, uh, you know, step in. So it's it's almost always more helpful to have someone who can point us in the right direction. Uh, at that time. <laughs> yes? I think you had made a mention about the defense of protecting yourself, but that also goes with other people too. Yes, and, and I made the, the classic mistake, which is when I talk about self-defense, it also includes defense of others. I can defend my wife, my child, I could defend Chad, just like I was defending myself. Uh, and, and so although we call it self-defense, under the law, it's called uh, defensive persons, whether it's yourself or a third person. Of course, that always, that always goes away if the person is leaving away from you. Okay. If, if they're leaving, no again, there's, there's got to be an imminent danger of death or serious physical injury. If they're turning and they're running, um, at that point in time, I'm not sure what that danger would be. Uh, we did have a case, and this was a long, long, long time ago. I had dark hair and a flat belly when this case happened. Um, it, uh, there was a guy who had, there was two brothers who had, who had attacked him and they had him down on the ground and they went to shoot him and the gun malfunctioned. And at least one of them went to turn to run and as he was running, the guy on the ground was able to get free and he fired a shot and it ended up striking and killing one of, one of the two brothers. But we determined that to be self-defense because at that point in time there was still a danger to him because I think the other brother was still there. Tom probably remains the case. And, and the law specifically addresses that as well. It says that in order for, for that to take place, uh, someone has to withdraw from the encounter and they have to effectively communicate that they've withdrawn from the encounter before, <laughs> before self-defense is out the window. So as an example, if I were to come up and, and punch you just repeatedly, right? You could pull out a firearm or a knife in defense of yourself, right? And if I say, hey, I'm done. I didn't know you had a knife. I didn't know you had a gun. I'm just gonna go home now. You can't then claim self-defense and shoot me in the back because I've withdrawn and I effectively communicated that to you. So that's only as far as your self-defense goes. Where did that next scenario, where, where does it stop where if you're trying to hold him there for the police and he leaves anyway? Well, if, if, they, if it's reasonable to believe that they committed a crime and if they did in fact commit a crime, you can hold them until law enforcement arrives. However, it goes back to that's maybe not your best option because you know police are paid 
um, a relatively low wage to go try to find that guy. You are not. So, um, and that and that's really one of the things I hit on in my class is that the law is almost always okay with you using an appropriate amount of force in defense of people, and less so much deadly force in defense of things. And that's really the good a good way to look at it. Is there each constitutional carry is approved by each state, right? Is, is there one a national? There's, there's been some talk that if enough states adopt a constitutional permitless carry that they would become reciprocal, but I think we're way far away from that. I, I don't think that's that's practical anytime soon. Yes? What about schools and school buses? Do you think there will ever be a time that that will be okay to carry? In, in Missouri right now, a school district can option to have staff harm it's it has to be a, a decision made by that school district by the school board and it's not been adopted in very many are there any in Missouri doing that uh, it's if, if so it's on a very small scale but right now in Missouri they have the ability to do that to arm their staff as long as they comply with a certain annual training uh, they're allowed uh, to arm staff yes oh, Well, the, the question was just for the video viewers was whether or not uh, there will be a requirement for for school since they since there's a the, the idea behind that is that there's a law saying that you can't carry at a school so the state should then supply an armed person at that school there's there's nothing in discussion at this time in, under this current bill to address that <laughs> and i think that'll be something that's maybe done through either additional legislation or through an appeal process to to have that added in but not not at this time. There's not anything. Yes. Uh, you talked a bit before about uh, business disrupting you no know, firearms that would be uh, trespassing. Correct. Uh, how is it different, or is it different for a school or a hospital? Yeah, a school is specifically mentioned in the in the statute that that's a prohibited place for you to carry a firearm. It says uh, on the on the premises of a school, a school bus, or at any event that's sponsored or uh, sanctioned by the school board. So as an example, the, uh, the high school, Carthage High School, plays uh, their soccer team plays their games at the YMCA soccer fields. Right now, with no game going on, I can go to the soccer field with a, with a concealed carry firearm. They don't have a rule. If there were a high school sporting event going on, I would not be able to carry a firearm because that's a school-sponsored school event. That's specifically listed uh, in the statute. So that's not part of the private business. So is it a higher charge? It is. It is. Uh, both now and under this new bill, if it were adopted, it's a higher criminal charge. Your question? Okay. Any other? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. My last one. No problem. Um, if you have like the insulin carry here mm -hmm. without a license, but I go to Arkansas and I have a if, what kind of things, what kind of you need to be in Okay, so the question is if, if you choose to carry under this bill without obtaining a permit, how that works in other states. And there are 49 other states, so there are 49 laws that you would be, be in violation of depending on which state you went to. Kansas is a constitutional carry state, meaning residents of Kansas are not required to have a permit to conceal carry within Kansas. If they come into Missouri, they're committing the offense of unlawful use of a weapon by um, concealing a firearm without a permit that's either issued by the state or reciprocal with the state. So you would have to have a permit when traveling to a state that honors the current Missouri permit. And that won't change under the new bill, I know. The, in the, the vehicle, uh, the, in the question in your vehicle, that's different in all 49 states as well. For example, there are some states that the law says at the 
as, as soon as it's practical with contact uh, by a law enforcement officer, you're required to let them know that you have a firearm either on your person or in your vehicle in some states. That's not the case in Missouri, but there are some states. And it's your responsibility to know that as a person traveling mm -hmm. through the state. And I'll tell you, actually, this, uh, oh, oh, yes, they are. This stack of papers, um, this is a pretty substantial stack of papers. And all this discusses is if you're pulled over in another state, what you have to do to be legal. And you can see how, how big this stack is. So you think about every portion of every law, it's gonna be a pretty substantial stack of papers. So, but I do have that information, what you're required to do. If you guys wanna see that after the, the seminar, we, we'd be more than happy to show that to you. So. Are there any other? Yes, sir. Very good. Because the Senate was right on the line at the beginning of the House. So, just for the video, we're, we're pretty well represented. Our, our state reps in Southwest Missouri are, are in favor of, of this legislation. Um, and I know I know where you stand on it. So, um, we we really uh, we appreciate that. And we we are always on the side of more freedom. So, that's where we default to on any issue. So, yes, sir. Is that if this bill takes effect, it only affects Missouri residents, current Missouri residents. No, if you were visiting, you would still be bound by the, the legal requirements as an as an out of state, you know, that another state resident. So, yes, sir. I know this is mostly about firearms, but what about other weapons? As far as mine, uh, you know, right now you don't have to sit very for if you're carrying. I'm going to refer that. I'm just going to step out of the way here. I'll have to go back and take a look at it, but I think this only applies to firearms. Thank you. That was like, way easier than I thought it was. <laughs> I don't think it applies, to, and I know things like the, the, that are just ex expressly outlawed, which is why I think this applies only to firearms. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, guys, I really appreciate being here. If you have further questions, we're, we would be more than happy to stick around and answer. I know that we're going to have some more questions online. Uh, if you will, if, if, you, if you think of any other questions, write them down, submit them via Facebook, give us a call and ask that question. Stop by the store and ask us the question. We're trying to make a catalog of frequently asked questions in regards to this bill so that we can just refer people to that who weren't able to attend this or going into the future. On or about September 14th, when the when the secondary vote takes place, uh, we will make an announcement probably via Facebook and on our website. If you don't know the website, you can pick up a pamphlet before you leave the door. It's uh, libertytreellc.com. It's posted on the screen and on the video. Uh, please visit that, and we will try to announce the status of this law as it, as it either is... Uh, uh, vetoed if the veto continues or if it's uh, overridden so we'll try to uh, update that as much as possible but please continue asking these questions submitting the question because as i said we'd like to create a catalog so that other people can just read those and, and be informed um, i really really appreciate you guys being here i don't know very many areas of the state or country where we would get this kind of turnout we've had over a thousand people view the facebook live feed video uh, over two thousand now so we really appreciate that and don't think that that's lost on us guys um, but as we say in the concealed carry course before we send you out the door we want to continue to be a resource for you so um, please if you if you have those questions continue to ask and we're going to stick around for about another 15 to 20 minutes this the shop is still open um, if you guys want to want to shop around but i will be available up here i think you can probably stick around for a little bit um, as long as we need to we'll stick around guys so thank you and um, again i want to thank eli and gabe because they're doing this, you know, on their own with their own private business out of out of their own time, and I really think that's awesome. So if you guys. Are